And you were listening to Pacifica Radio 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB FM in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and K248BR in Santa Cruz, and of course online at kpfa.org. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, I'll be speaking to San Francisco Bay Area National Lawyers Guild President Judith Merkinson on the delegation report back from Haiti and also be speaking to senior columnist and editor for Black Agenda Report, Margaret Kimberly, on the case against Julian Assange. Stay tuned. And we're going to start off the show. We're going to talk to Judith Merkinson, and she's got a report back on Haiti. And she was able to visit Haiti with a contingent of folks uh, through the Haiti Action Committee and other organizations. Um, And she's here, came back to talk about it. She was there from March 28th to around April 6th or 7th or so. And she can clear that up if I'm not right about that. And uh, Judith Mergensen is actually the president for the San Francisco Bay Area National Lawyers Guild. So this contingent of folks, it it consisted of some pretty heavyweights. Pretty big heavyweights there, um, observing, talking to the people on the ground, on the front lines of the uh, recent uprisings. And uh, Judith, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. It's your first time with us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having us. Yeah. All right. So there's there's so many different facets to what is happening in AT right now. Um, I had the opportunity of speaking with uh, Robert Roth, who is also a part of your contingent. Um, and it, there's so much that's going on. That basically, the latest uprising got started uh, due to the, um, the the price hike of the fuel um, that was brought in by the Venezuelan government through the Petro Caribe, that whole uh, situation to help the people of Haiti uh, overcome what's happening to them as far as not having enough food and not having enough for infrastructure, not being able to rebuild since the earthquake of 2010. Talk to us about what you're seeing now or what you saw when you were in Haiti recently. We went to Haiti um, from March 30th to April 5th, and th- I went with people from Haiti Action Committee and also uh, people from Global Women's Strike and Margaret Prescott from KPFK. And what we saw, it was a very interesting trip because we sort of went from the sublime to the absolute horror. Mm -hmm. Uh, We were asked to go for two reasons. We were asked by President and Mrs. Aristide to attend the graduation from their university, UNIFA, the University of President Aristide, foundation. And this is a university that was set up before the 2004 coup. And actually, one of the first things that the coup did was they trashed the university. The U.S. Marines came in and occupied the university, which is a medical school, a nursing school, a law school. It's going to be a dental school, an agricultural institute. And what it is, is it's a university for the grassroots, for people that wouldn't necessarily be able to get an education. And this year they graduated 153 lawyers. Nice. uh, Sorry, doctors, uh, 34 nurses, 19 lawyers, and eight physical therapists. And it was an amazing event. Oh, I, I just can't even begin to tell you the joy that people felt walking into this very serious very dignified event and watching these young people get their diplomas. Mm. And, you know, it was just incredible. And in fact, the mainstream television station, which is no friend of President Aristide, streamed it live. And the next day, the entire country, all they heard was kudos from the whole country about what they had actually achieved. And we were there as international observers, and it made a big difference. Mm-hmm. So that was fantastic. Mm-hmm. But then the next day, we went to this, which was the other reason that we went. We went to the site of uh, a massacre in a small part of 
Port-au-Prince, downtown Port-au-Prince called La Saline. And La Saline is the home. It's a center for Lavalas, the grassroots party of uh, the people of Haiti. And many of the demonstrations that have happened there, especially in the last period of time, have started in La Saline. And so there was a big demonstration in August and throughout the fall asking, where is the petro Carib money? And petro Carib, as you said, was this program of subsidies, basically, but from the Venezuelan government to the people of Haiti um, in the form of gas subsidies that was supposed to provide infrastructure and other social services to the people of Haiti. Instead, $3.8 billion have disappeared. Yes, you heard me, $3.8 billion. And in addition, they wanted to raise the price of gas because this Mm. disappeared. And so the people have revolted and said, where is that money? Mm -hmm. And it's just typical. It's the same exact thing that happened, you know, after the earthquake when billions of dollars were poured into Haiti and nothing was done. It just Mm -hmm. went into people's pockets. Mm -hmm. So, Including the Clintons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, including (laughs) the Clintons, right, Um, who used money to build a pot, the most posh hotel in Haiti for aid workers and their friends. Um, Yeah, a lot of the demonstrations were started in that. And that was the also La Saline is the neighborhood where uh, President Aristide's church was also where Mm. he practiced. Mm -hmm. So this is a very historic Lavala stronghold. And there's been a lot of back and forth. And it's a very complicated story. But what we saw... um, was that in November, on November 13th, the police and basically death squads, weaponized death squad gangs, Mm -hmm. went into La Saline and ransacked the entire neighborhood and killed hundreds of people, uh, burned them alive, hacked them to death, left their bodies out to be eaten by pigs, left the houses were completely destroyed and basically, and this has continued. Um, it happened in November and other neighborhoods since then have also been attacked. And what the, we know that the government was complicit in this people arrived with police uniforms and there has been, uh, bragging basically on the internet and on social media say, talking about how, they are going to deal with these neighborhoods and deal with Lava Loss. And I think that um, what's really horrifying Mm -hmm. is first you see the destruction and you hear the accounts of so many people talking and so many women talking about how their husbands, their brothers, their sons were murdered. But then what happened was we went to see to a neighborhood close by, actually on the site of the port where enslaved Africans were brought in historically. And there was this abandoned market that was never used, these slabs of concrete. Mm-hmm. And that's where some of the refugees from this neighborhood were living with nothing. We saw women who had given birth to babies on the concrete floor. Children. I mean, it was <sighs> horrifying. I, all I can tell you is it was a very interesting experience for us because we went there, we saw, we saw skeletons left on the floor of, of houses of a woman who had been burned alive, a pregnant woman. We saw a school, we saw bullet holes in the houses that Aristide had built for the people, these huge bullet holes, Mm. Uh, we saw schools that had been shot up where five students were killed and two teachers. I mean, on and on. And then we went and saw the survivors. And in some ways, seeing the survivors was worse mm. because we realized like, just the level of terror and trauma yeah. that these people were living with. And it, it was completely and utterly enraging. That's all I can say. <laughs> I mean, wow. it's horrifying and enraging. And, and mm. you know, for us, 
it was like the first part we're seeing this incredible graduation and these young people clearly from the grassroots who are so proud and their parents who are so proud of them. And then the next day to go to this. And they're the two sides of the same coin because Mm -hmm. the graduation is to do away with what's happening in these neighborhoods and the terror and repression is to do away with what actually uh, the foundation and the university are achieving. And uh, the next week, mm-hmm. actually, this our program on the 11th, which is uh, this Saturday, and it's going to be at 518 Valencia, which is at 16th Street from 3 to 5, is also going to include a lot of video footage. And it's also, the two weeks later, another delegation went with uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, and uh, Danny Glover, among others, Walter Riley from the National Lawyers Guild, mm-hmm. Pierre Lavoisier from Haiti Action. Mm-hmm. And um, so to document further what we were doing. So we're trying to provide a picture Thank you. of human rights accounting of what's going on in Haiti mm-hmm. because people often forget Haiti. Mm, yes, I do. You know, it's interesting because of, mm-hmm. of the regime change that the administration is trying in Venezuela. People have talked about the coup and they, they say the model for the coup in Venezuela is Honduras. But actually, the model for Honduras was Haiti. That's and right. somehow, you know, people have to remember that that's that's there and it often gets left off. Most definitely. We've got a few minutes left. We're actually uh, less than one minute left. And I just want to, this may be a rhetorical question. I understand that there is the the need to have this uh, human rights uh, accountability for what has been happening, what is happening to this day right now at this moment in Haiti. Um, Maxine Waters is going. So that means that uh, members of the United States government are getting involved and, and keeping that light shown on what is happening. Uh, Maxine Waters has a history, keeping an eye on what's happening in Haiti. What would be the next step, really quickly, what would be the next step to trying to, to give some relief to that country, even though the United States government has a history of repressing it over and over and over again? I think we have to press the uh, the left, the international community, mm-hmm. as well as the government to allow uh, few uh, free and fair elections in Haiti. The elections have been stolen for the last 15 years. Mm-hmm. They're purposely being repressed. And we have to acknowledge that. And I think once you begin to acknowledge that, then we can pressure both the international community, the United Nations, our government, to actually have hands off Haiti and to allow the Haitian people to determine their own destiny. It's definitely. It's not been allowed. Absolutely. Judith Merkinson, she is the president of the National Lawyers Guild for the San Francisco Bay Area. We are out of time, unfortunately. And we'll be giving you more information about the event that's on the 11th of May. That's on the 11th of May in San Francisco. Judith Merkinson, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. Thank you. Switch gears and talk about Julian Assange. Um, we have Margaret Kimberly. She is a senior columnist and editor for Black and Gender Report. Um, and I was very intrigued by your uh, column on uh, March 28th for Black Agenda Report, talking about Julian Assange and his case. Now, that was from March 28th, so that was uh, before. He was yanked out of the Ecuadorian embassy. Margaret Kimberly, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening once again. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So uh, what prompted you to write the article, first of all? Let's talk about that. Well, at the, since I, I wrote that two weeks later, he was, uh, April 11th, he was uh, 
the Ecuadorians uh, revoked the citizenship the prior president had given him and expelled him, ended his asylum and expelled him and put him in the hands of the British government. But I was moved to write about Assange because uh, his case is our case. That is to say, any journalist, anyone in media, anyone uh, particularly reporting information that the state uh, does not want to uh, have known should be supporting Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning. He had been in the Ecuadorian embassy in London for seven years. He was given asylum by the then President Rafael Correa. There's since been a change in, in administration uh, there, and Lenin Moreno was uh, not supportive of him. Uh, since the Trump administration came to power, they decided to get him. The Obama administration also wanted to get him, but they decided to leave him alone. They called it the New York Times problem because much of the information he leaked was, was often used by the corporate media, who have now turned against him. But there were times when major media used WikiLeaks information. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they decided to just leave it alone. The Trump administration, in their uh, zeal to be the most imperialist in, of imperialists, have uh, decided to get him. They renewed charges in a uh, uh, grand jury in Washington, they called Chelsea Manning to testify. She refused and is now in jail again, despite having her first con uh, conviction commuted by the Obama administration. So things were clearly picking up. It was clear that they were going to make their move against him, and that happened on uh, April the 11th. Uh, he is charged. The U.S. is trying to extradite him. And uh, the charge is that he um, hacked into... Uh, secure systems, um, and uh, that is not true. Nobody hacked anything. Chelsea Manning, then Bradley Manning, leaked information to WikiLeaks. Julian Assange was assisting uh, Manning in getting a new password so that uh, this could, information could be sent undetected, but at no time did he or Manning hack into any system. So it's, it's also based on a lie. But it's obvious the, the bigger crime is that those Iraq war logs, as they were called, among the many thousands of documents that uh, Manning leaked, showed clear evidence of U.S. war crimes in Iraq. It's a video I can't watch the whole thing, showing yeah. uh, people being uh, 12 people being killed in Iraq by a U.S. gunship, the soldiers laughing. They mm -hmm. think it's funny that they've killed people. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it's the sort of thing that the state does not want to see seen, and that is Julian Assange's real crime, whatever it is that they state in court. Yeah, it was intense. That uh, that footage is just too intense for words, and and, and now it's actually in pretty heavy circulation, uh, as far yeah, as yeah, it's uh, called colla collateral murder. You can people mm -hmm. can find it on YouTube. There's a longer and a shorter ver uh, version, but yes, pe those who um, have more intestinal fortitude than I can can watch it yeah it's a uh, way too intense way too intense for words it just uh really peels back the layer of of ugliness um and and he's has a history of doing that julian assange has a history of doing that now that they have uh, uh taken him yanked him kidnapped him if you would uh, out of the Ecuadorian embassy uh he has now been given a uh, 50 week sentence um for uh for not appearing in the, right. uh, the British courts, um, ha I see it as as a reprieve of sorts. You know, where his team, his legal team, will at least have some time to try and 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 uh, create some type of some level of uh, of uh, um, defense for him, um, mm -hmm. because uh, they're doing what they're doing uh, here in the United States over in Virginia, uh, as far as the secret courts or what have you, trying to, to figure out how to pull him out. Uh, when we were speaking off mic, uh, you have the belief that they could do it sooner before his 50-week sentence is up. Do you think that the uh, English government is going to hang on to him for the full 50 weeks, or do you think that they'll be pressured by the United States government to yank him out before his 50-week term is up? I think they will do it. They want to get him to. They, um, you know, the U.S. and uh, American governments are partners in crime. Uh, the case is uh, adjourned till May 30th, so he won't be back in court until then. Uh, the 
uh, uh, June 12th, the, the U.S. government has until June 12th to present uh, uh, the deadline for them to reveal any new charges, and, and it is assumed that there will be a, additional charges against them. But the U.S. and U.K. have a, a waiver, a clause in their extradition treaty, which pretty much allows the U.S. to extradite anybody from the U.K. for any reason that they want. Um, I think they – at first I thought they would do it quickly, but now I think they they want to make it look good. They want to give it some legitimacy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think they will not do anything until this adjournment date at least. That's my prediction. But the U.S. wants him, and Britain will give him up. Mm. So uh, barring uh, intervention from, say, the European – court on human rights, I think he's going to end up in the United States. And, and that will be terrible. Yes, it will. It will. What do you think that means for, for journalists uh, around the globe? I mean, what is that? What, what, well, what is it, your... means, it means mm -hmm. that anybody can be snatched up for any, anyone who is an investigative journalist. Anyone who gets classified information can be snatched up by the United States. And these countries, these, you know, we're always told that, you know, the U.S. is exceptional and its allies are exceptional and the U.K. is a democracy and Australia is a democracy and um, are the developed countries, the advanced countries, all these adjectives of that uh, uh, there's a connotation of superiority. Mm -hmm. All these countries are just um, lapdogs of the United States. They're vassal states, puppet states. They do whatever the U.S. wants them to do. They are actually, they are all in sync together. It's not like they're being forced. Um, they want to be on the same side. Mm -hmm. So they will violate their own laws uh, in order to uh, support um, the hegemon, the, the United States. Mm -hmm. So uh, Australia, he's an Australian citizen. It's disgraceful, but his government did nothing to protect him. Right. Because they're part of, uh, you know, it's called the, I don't know if your listeners are, are aware of the, the five eyes, yeah. the surveillance uh, apparatus of uh, the five English-speaking uh, countries, uh, major countries, the set England and the uh, uh, settler colonial states that it spawned, the U.K., Canada, U.S., Australia, and New Zealand, called the five eyes, mm -hmm. and there's uh, uh, this CIA and MI6 and all their intelligence agencies work very closely together. There are U.S. Uh, bases in Australia. There is a facility at a, in a place called Pine Gap, Australia, where there is a listening post for almost the entire world hmm. um, and where they surveil uh, Internet traffic from all over the planet. That's in Australia. So that tells you what side Australia is on. And if there's a choice between... Uh, maintaining the system or protecting an individual who happens to be a, cist, uh, an, a, uh, a citizen, well, they're going to side with the United States. Wow, that's um, that's pretty scary. Yeah, I forgot all about the five eyes. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> that's such a spooky name. I just learned of it a few months ago, but uh, yeah, yeah. they use the term, so we we should be familiar with it, with it Absol as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's another thing. There's absolutely no consideration being taken for the fact that he is a, an Australian citizen. And the fact that they are, the Australian government is complicit in what is happening to him, mm -hmm. you know, that that should prompt them to, to try to, you know, exact their own level of, of uh, justice, if you would. You know, if, if anybody's going to do it, it should be, that, that, you know, their country of origin for that particular person, Right. But well, it, you should be, and I suspect that if he were a common criminal, mm -hmm. that the Australian government would right. have intervened on his behalf. If he were, right. you know, accused of robbing a bank or something, right. I, I think they would at least go through some motions of giving him uh, some protections from his country. Mm -hmm. But he's messing with the boss, so that's not going to happen. And journalists, you, uh, I think I digressed a little from your question about okay. uh, journalism. It, you know, we have. We always hear about state-run media in right. another country. Right. Well, that's what we have. Um, the corporate media uh, have, I'm going to say, no investigative journalism anymore. Uh, there was a study this week which showed that no one in corporate media questioned the U.S. Uh, attempt to intervene 
in Venezuela this week. Mm-hmm. Not one. None of them. Uh, so do we really have journalism or do we just have scribes? And we have journalism is diminished, first of all, as you know, there's uh, mm-hmm. fewer outlets that actually pay people to make a living as journalists. Okay. The ones that are left are, are highly paid and in these major outlets that are most closely uh, allied with government uh, policies. So if they were real journalists, mm. they would be protesting on Assange's behalf. So despite the fact that the uh, Obama administration had what they called this New York Times problem and decided to not to bother trying to get Julian Assange, the New York Times editorials since he was arrested have been just horrible. They've been absolutely horrible. He's not really a journalist. He's really a spy. And because he has been blamed for uh, Hillary Clinton's loss, it's uh, we are being told over and over again that um, uh, he, the Russians hacked into the DNC and got Hillary Clinton's emails and gave them to WikiLeaks, so he is blamed for Donald Trump being president. Hmm. We're never told that there's evidence that um, those emails were leaked. That's right. They weren't hacked. They were given to someone who gave them to, uh, to WikiLeaks. Mm-hmm. And as far as, um, I mean, and, and it is called WikiLeaks. They're supposed to leak information. That's their job. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, I, I think it's questionable that that's why Hillary Clinton lost. The biggest reason she lost is um, because they, she's deplorable. Nickel's time to get out the vote operation and let <laughs> Republicans right. steal black people's votes. The, you know, right. the usual way. The whole but, list. Um, the whole list. Absolutely. Yes. I, and, and just to... Uh, uh, Point people's or point the audience's attention to your article in Black Agenda Report, dated March twenty eighth, and that's uh, of course Freedom Rider Julian Assange, and of course talking about Russia Gate, and uh, we can get more information in regards to that DNC leak from veteran intelligence professionals for Sanity, and of course Margaret Kimberly, uh, senior columnist and editor for Black Agenda Report, links to that particular article there. Uh, it's uh, connected to Con- Consortium News. And and want to let folks know and close it out here. Black Agenda Report has been put on a list of media outlets alleged to be under Russian government influence. Couldn't be a bigger crock of BS. Margaret Kimberly. <laughs> well, we're proud to be on the list because it means we tell the that's truth. Right. That's, that's why we're on the list. <laughs> Fist held high, <laughs> chin held up. Margaret Kimberly, thank you so much for taking the time. Looking forward to speaking with you once again in the very, very, very near future. Thank you very much. The Haiti Report Back is going to be held at 518 Valencia Street, 518 Valencia Street in San Francisco. That is the Eric Casada Center for Culture and Politics. It is wheelchair accessible. That's on May 11th from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. in San Francisco, 518 Valencia Street, wheelchair accessible. And that does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. A big thank you to my guests, Judith Merkinson and Margaret Kimberly for taking the time. The lovely Lucrecia Burton is on the controls. I will not be back next week. We are in Fun Drive. You can give securely at kpfa.org and it's also tax deductible. Art Narc Radio is up next. Have a wonderful week of resistance community and thank you for for listening. KPFA's 2019 local station board election is about to start. We invite you to become a voting member by renewing your membership before June 30th. In order to save money and trees, we are implementing an electronic ballot election with paper ballots being issued to members who request them. E-ballots will be issued to all members with a valid email on file. Members who need a paper ballot can leave a voicemail for the election supervisor at 510-854-9663 with their name, address, and telephone number. A number of members are missing emails. Please help us make this election green by visiting elections.pacifica.org and filling out a ballot request form, including the email you would like us to use to send you a ballot. Ballots go out August 15th, 2019.
listening to KPFA 